to talk to you today. No, sorry. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about some joint work I carried out with my supervisor, Toby Cubitt, who's also at UCL, looking at toy models of holographic duality between local Hamiltonians. Uh, so I guess the first thing, first thing to, to cover is what are holographic dualities? Why should we be interested in toy models of them? And um, what's the relevance of local Hamiltonians? So the holographic principle is a general principle in um, theories of quantum gravity. And what it states is that a quantum gravity theory living in D plus one dimensional space time is equivalent to a many body system defined on the boundary of that space time, where the many body system is, is sort of a, a non-gravitational theory. Um, and the reason this is kind of interesting is we obviously we don't have a well understood theory of quantum gravity, but we do understand kind of non gravitational quantum systems much better. So there's a hope that by kind of studying the non gravitational theory, we can and then mapping back into kind of what's going on in the bulk of this um, of this space time, we can hopefully get some intuition for for theories of quantum gravity. Um, so as I said, this is kind of conjectured to be a, a general principle that should hold for any theory of quantum gravity. Um, but there's one particular manifestation of this um, principle that's particularly well studied. And that's what's known as the ADS-CFT correspondence. Um, so the ADS-CFT correspondence is a conjectured duality between uh, quantum gravity theories living in anti de Sitter space and conformal field theories living on the, on the boundary of that space time. As like I said, this is kind of the, the most well studied um, manifestation of the holographic principle. Um, it's been kind of around for around 20 years now, and there's been a huge body of research looking into it. And you know, that, that body of research has led to some, you know, some very nice results and understanding of what's going on in this duality. Um, but as, as you might expect, it's a very complicated theory. And although there have been some nice results, we're still you know, a very long way away from a fully kind of rigorous understanding of this duality. Um, and because we don't have a fully kind of rigorous understanding of this, of this duality and the dictionary between the bulk theory and the boundary theory, this has led to some interest in constructing rigorous toy models of the, of the theory instead. So the idea of these toy models is they don't capture the full kind of depth of the theory, but they capture some aspects of the theory. And the nice thing about them is that they're exactly solvable. Um, so they're, they're a different way to get a handle on what's going on. A lot of these toy models um, use, use techniques from quantum information theory, which is why as quantum information theory, so we might, we might be interested in studying these. Um, and yeah, a lot, a lot of these toy models already existed before this work by me and Toby. Um, and these toy models are very nice. They, they managed to capture lots of the structural features of ADS-CFT, but what they, what they weren't able to do is a mapping between models, where by models, I mean a mapping between a family of local Hamiltonians in the bulk theory and a family of local Hamiltonians in the boundary theory. And the reason we, we might want local Hamiltonians on the boundary theory is that if we have some, some global Hamiltonian acting on, on the boundary of our toy model, that global Hamiltonian is kind of is lost all, all relationship to the boundary geometry. So there's not really any sense anymore in which it lives in one dimension lower. Um, so for that reason, these kind of having a, having a toy model of ADS-CFT where you have a nice, a nice well understood bulk Hamiltonian, but a, a complicated global boundary Hamiltonian is a bit unsatisfying. And for that reason, in these previous toy models, they tended to just look at the mapping of states of observables, and they didn't look at the mapping on the level of Hamiltonians. So although they were useful for, for kind of investigating some aspects of ADS-CFT, what they weren't able to do is look at things like time dynamics and energy scales in the, in the theory. So in this, in this talk, I'm going to talk you through as our, as our toy model, which is the first toy model on the level of local Hamiltonians. Um, and I'm hopefully going to going to convince you that using using this toy model, we can we can study some more interesting aspects of ADS CFT. So in the rest of the seminar, I'm going to start by giving giving some background. So I'm going to give a very brief, very very brief overview of the ADS CFT correspondence um, and some of the features of that that we're going to try and capture in our toy models. And then I'm going to talk about something called the Happy Code. And this is one of these earlier toy models that we build on very heavily in our work. And then I'm going to talk about Hamiltonian simulation, which is kind of the extra ingredient we add into our toy model um, in, order to, in order to get this duality on the level of local Hamiltonians. Once I've gone through that background, I'll talk about our toy model. Um, I'm going to kind of give you a high level overview of how it's constructed, but then I'm going to concentrate on what we can use it for. And in particular, I'll talk briefly through how we might look at black hole formation in the toy model. So first off, ADS-CFT. So as I said, ADS-CFT is a um, conjectured duality between a gravity theory living in anti de Sitter space time, which is um, maximally symmetric space time of constant negative curvature, um, and a conformal field theory living on the boundary of that space time. Um, so I expect most people in this uh, talk are quantum information theorists rather than um, high energy physicists. So throughout this talk, I'll just be modeling um, time slices of anti de Sitter space as, um, as tessellations of hyperbolic two space and hyperbolic three space. 
um, and then and then the time the kind of the time axis will be will be um going along. So we've got here what we've got here is anti two plus one. So the the space kind of dimension is the tessellation of the hyperbolic two plane, and we've got time going up this axis axis here. And then the conformal field theory here is living on the boundary of this, of this space time. So in the in the um, in the two dimensional case here, what we've got is the boundary theory is a, is a one dimensional theory. So the idea of ADS CFT is that any state observable um, operator living in this in this gravitational bulk theory can be mapped to some state observable operator living in the non-gravitational theory on its boundary. So why is quantum information theory should we be interested in ADS CFT and, and why might someone think that quantum information tools are good tools to use to build toy models? Well, tools from quantum information theory um, have proved to be quite fruit, fruitful in studying ADS CFT. Um, so I'm just going to talk briefly through, through two, of those, um, two of those tools. So the first one is entanglement. And I'm not going to say very much about this because Harriet's going to talk much more about the relationship between entanglement and ADS-CFT in her talk, but I just want to briefly highlight it. Um, so in ADS-CFT, in ADS what you find is that there's a really interesting relationship between entanglement in the boundary theory and geometry in the bulk theory. And the way this manifests is that what you find is that the entropy of boundary subregions um, in ADS-CFT, it corresponds to the area of a particular surface in the bulk. Um, so that's kind of an interesting hint that you might, um, you might, you might expect quantum information tools to be useful studying ADS-CFT because we get a nice, um, a nice relationship between entanglement in the boundary, which is obviously a quantum information um, tool, and geometry in the bulk, which is a, a more gravitational um, aspect of the theory. Um, and Harris can talk much more about this in her, in her seminar. The other place where, where you see quantum information really coming into ADS CFT is in that in the way that bulk operators are reconstructed on the boundary. Um, so just to give an example, uh, if we consider a bulk operator acting right in the center of the bulk and consider where we can reconstruct this bulk operator on the boundary, what we find is that this bulk operator is, in, is encoded non-locally in multiple parts of the boundary. So for example, if we consider the boundary subregions R1, R2, and R3, what we find is that we, we can reconstruct this bulk operator on any two of our one, our two, and our three, but not on any one. So what you have is that this um, the way this, this duality is working is kind of like an error correcting code. And what you find is that um, this error correcting code can cope, can correct for erasures of certain boundary subregions. Um, for this, uh, for an operator acting right in the center of the bulk, what we find is you know the, this um, these boundary regions are kind of rotation invariance. It doesn't matter where we choose our one, our two, and our three. All that matters is, is their sizes. And if, if we have a large enough boundary region, we can, we, we can reconstruct operators living right in the center of the bulk. For operators living closer to the boundary, there is still, still some um, correction, for, uh, correction for erasure of boundary subregions. What we find is that it's no longer kind of rotation invariance. So if we consider a boundary operator living kind of very close to the sorry, a bulk operator acting very close to the boundary. What we'll find is that there, there exists quite a small boundary subregion which we can use to reconstruct this this um this bulk operator, but but it may matter where the boundary subregion is. So if you move to a different small subregion elsewhere on the boundary, you're not going to be able to reconstruct this um boundary this bulk operator. Um, and in fact, you can show that you know bulk operators living near the edge of the boundary, they're much less well corrected against erasure. Um, so you can see this, this, this duality is a quantum error correcting code, but it's a quantum error correcting code with you know, some strange kind of non-typical properties. So that's kind of a very, very high level overview of the features of ADS-CFT that we're going to be trying to capture in our toy models. So, so how do we go about capturing these kind of features in toy models? Um, well, as I said, the happy code is, is an is a, uh, earlier toy model that we build on heavily in our work. And the way the happy code works is it's a tensor network toy model of ADS CFT. And the, as a tensor network, the, the building blocks of the network are what's called perfect tensors. So a perfect tensor is defined as a tensor which um, if, you, if you partition its indices into any, dis, any two disjoint subsets, the, the mapping defined by the tensor network is always an isometry from the smaller set of indices to the larger set of indices. Um, so that's what's called a perfect tensor. And these tensors are connected to lots of other kind of interesting um, notions in quantum information theory. So the, the states defined by uh, perfect tensors are absolutely maximally entangled states. Um, 
and the isometry is defined by these perfect tensors. They're, they're the encoding isometries of quantum secret sharing schemes and maximum distance separable quantum error correcting codes. These perfect tensors are kind of interesting in their own right, and they're very nice tools to use to build these toy models of ADS CFT. Now, these, uh, these, ten these perfect tensors, they're obviously kind of, the, the definition of them is quite highly constrained. And you might be wondering, you know, are these, are these tensors things that only exist for very particular choices of, um, of, you know, of numbers of indices and bond dimension, or are they something more generic? Um, and it is known that they are completely generic in the sense that for any number of indices you give me, I will always be able to construct a perfect tensor on that number of indices, as long as you give me the freedom to increase the bond dimension. Um, so you can't get them for arbitrary pairs of bond dimension and indices, but you can get them for any number of indices, provided you can increase the bond dimension. Mara? Yeah? What's an isometric tensor? Um, so it's just, uh, if you view the tensor as a mapping from, from kind of, if you, if you view these indices as um, qubits, you might have, you view, view some of them as input qubits and some of them as, as output qubits. And if it's an isometric tensor, it's just an isometry from one set, from the smaller set of uh, legs to the larger set of legs. Great, thank you. Cool, so these, these perfect tensors, these are the um, building blocks of our error correcting code. Um, but how, sorry, not of our encoding code, of, our, of, our, of the happy toy model, but how are we going to put them together to construct this toy model? Um, so the, the idea is actually kind of very, very nice and simple. Um, essentially what you do is you take a tessellation of hyperbolic two space, um, and in, the, in this case we've tessellated it with pentagons, and in each cell of the tessellation you place a six leg perfect tensor. What you do next is you contract five legs of the perfect tensor with legs of neighboring tensors across the edges of the pentagons and the sixth index of the perfect tensor this this is left dangling and these um these kind of uncontracted legs these are our bulk degrees of freedom you then cut off the tessellation at some finite radius and the uncontracted indices um, on the on the boundary uh, these are our, our boundary degrees of freedom now, use some properties of the perfect tensors along with uh, some properties of the tessellation. And you can show that this tensor network, if you view it as a mapping from the uncontracted bulk indices to the uncontract uncontracted boundary, boundary indices, it's an isometry. And more than just that, it's an error correcting code. Um, and just as in ADS CFT, what you find is that if you look at the central bulk index and you map it out to the boundary, um, it can be reconstructed on, it, it requires a kind of an order one fraction of the boundary for reconstruction, but you can also, it can also, um, it's also protected against erasures of order one fractions of the boundary. If you take a, um, a, a bulk index living much closer to the boundary, what you'll find is when you map that out, there, there are some choices about very small boundary region where it can be reconstructed on, but it's also susceptible to loss um, if you erase particular small boundary subregions. So qualitatively, this is really capturing the kind of error correcting structure of ADS CFT. But also I put it down here at the bottom, it has some nice entanglement properties. So Harriet's gonna talk about this in much more detail, so I won't go into it, but I would just say, there is sort of some relationship between entanglement and geometry um, in this tensor network code, which captures some of the features of ADS CFT, um, but it doesn't go all the way. And Harriet's going to talk about a, a generalization of this code that, that captures more of the nice features we're interested in. Okay, so then what happens if we have a local bulk Hamiltonian acting on these, on these bulk degrees of freedom here and we map it out to the boundary? What's the geometry of that boundary Hamiltonian? So if we take a, a, a Hamiltonian term acting on two, uh, two bulk um, degrees of freedom acting very close to the boundary, what we'll find when we map that out to the boundary is that it can be reconstructed on a, on a nice small local, with a nice small local boundary, um, boundary um, Hamiltonian term. I should say, you know, this isn't the only way we can map out this, this bulk. Um, operator, there are other choices we could use, but since we're interested in trying to construct a boundary Hamiltonian that's local, what we're going to do is pick the kind of smallest, we're always going to look at the smallest um, region we could choose to reconstruct bulk operators. And for operators living near the bulk, that gives a nice local boundary Hamiltonian term. But if we look, if we look at operators living much nearer the center of the bulk, and we map those out, what we're going to find is that um, you, what you end up with is always a very large non-local boundary Hamiltonian term. Um, and that's, that's unavoidable. Um, so what you end up with 
if you take this nice local bulk Hamiltonian and you map it out to the boundary, what you end up with is a completely non-local boundary Hamiltonian. Um, and as I said, that's problematic. You know, we don't expect CFTs to have these huge non-local terms in them. Um, and also there's just no, you know, there's no real sense in which a geometrically kind of completely non-local boundary Hamiltonian is living in is living in the dimension we're interested in. So these holographic quantum error correcting codes, they give good toy models of ADS CFT for the way that states and observables are mapped. Um, but they, they don't give a nice mapping for local Hamiltonians, so we can't really use them to look at energy scales or time dynamics. Okay, so how are we going to get around this? What, what feature are we going to add to these toy models in order to, to get these um to get local Hamiltonians in the boundary? The um the, the technique we're going to use is Hamiltonian simulation. Um, obviously, Hamiltonian simulation is often thought of as kind of a very practical field of research. Um, and you might be surprised to see it coming up in a talk about holographic duality. Um, but although, you know, for a long time, Hamiltonian simulation has been primarily a, a practical field of research, a couple of years ago, Toby, along with some collaborators from the University of Bristol, they started looking at putting Hamiltonian simulation in a really rigorous theoretical setting. Um, and the way they did this is they, they took a load of operational requirements that you'd want a, um, a a simulation to have in order to be called a simulation. So all the prop, if you have a Hamiltonian H sim, which you, you which you want to simulate your Hamiltonian H, they wrote down all the properties you'd want H sim to have in order to be called a simulation. So you know you wanted to simulate all the static properties, all the dynamic properties, all the thermodynamic properties. Um, and starting from these operational requirements, what they did was they managed to pin down exactly the mathematical um, form that, that the mapping between H and H sim has to have. Um, and in the case of a perfect simulation, what you find is that that mathematical form is very restricted. Um, so just to just say in equation two here, it's not quite the most general form that a perfect simulation can take. Um, but the generalization um, you know, is, is still very restricted and um, we're not going to use the most general form in this talk. So I'll just stick to the, to the slightly simpler version. So what is a slightly simpler version? What you have is this H sim, um, you end up with having two terms. Um, this first term H prime is, is just given by this expression here, where V is an isometry. So what you have is that H prime um, projected onto the, um, onto the target space of this isometry is just isometrically equivalent to the target Hamiltonian H. And that's what this, this first term in the, in the expression is saying. Then the second term in this expression is a projector and delta here is just some big energy cutoff. So what this second term is doing is it's just pushing all the kind of junk, um, energy, all the kind of junk um, Hilbert space that we're not interested in, it pushes any states there up into very high energies. So essentially in, in the energy, in the kind of, um, in the Hilbert space we're interested in, H sim is just equal to a, um, it's just equal to, um, H mapped by some isometry. So this, you know, it's probably not that surprising that if you have this very restricted form, what you'll find is that your, um, your simulator Hamiltonian perfectly produces all of the properties of your target Hamiltonian um, because it is just mapped, you know, it is just isometrically equivalent. Um, and, you know, you can't get particularly interesting simulations if you restrict yourself to just, just allowing this. So what they do in the same paper is they also consider the case of approximate simulations. Um, and I'm not going to talk about kind of how you, um, you know, how you how you loosen the requirements to get an approximate simulation. Instead, I'm just going to talk briefly about um, the way you can use approximate simulations to take Hamiltonians with complex interaction graphs and simulate them by Hamiltonians with a nice, uh, much nicer interaction graphs. Tamara. Can yeah. I, uh, can I, so sorry for interrupting, no, can no, I ask a quick yeah, silly yeah. question about the uh, previous slides? Yeah, yeah, of course. So, so actually this, this second term with the, with the projection, could it also have been just included in H prime, given that uh, if I multiply with V V dagger, sort of doesn't this disappear anyways, or? Um, sorry, if you multiply with the V V dagger, so if you multiply what by with a VV dagger? Well, sorry, sorry. So this, this term with a delta identity minus VV dagger, couldn't I have just included that in H prime or where is this my? Um, so if you just include that in H prime, so H prime isn't actually equal to VHV dagger, but just 
its projection onto the learning use subspaces. Um, so H prime here, it might include some terms which act on the um, on the orthogonal complement of the projector. Um, so if we didn't have this delta term, we might um, there might be terms in H prime acting on the acting on the Hilbert space, but not interested in that have low energy. Um, I guess it yeah, it depends on your isometry. If you pick your isometry in such a way, you might be able to push them to high energy. Um, but uh, yeah, in general, we'll, we'll want the second term so that we can um, so that we can ensure that all the all the kind of all the terms we're not all the states we're not interested in it necessarily have high energy. Mm, okay. Yeah. Sorry, are there, are there any other questions at this stage? Um, cool. So yeah, as I said, these um these approximate simulations, what they allow us to do is take um take Hamiltonians with complex interaction graphs and simulate them by Hamiltonians with um, much nicer interaction graphs. And the way we do that is by using something called a perturbation gadget. And these are tools from the Hamiltonian complexity literature. And there, what they used to do is to construct reductions for in the kind of complexity theory sense. Um, but it was shown that these perturbation gadgets are actually doing something much stronger. They're not just um, preserving the, any, the lowest energy levels of these Hamiltonians. They are actually constructing full simulations. Um, so the way perturbation gadgets work, essentially, is you take a Hamiltonian, you add in some extra ancillary qubits, um, and you apply heavily weighted projections onto these ancillary qubits so that they're kind of projected down into one dimensional subspaces. And what that then allows you to do is to use these ancillary qubits to mediate interactions between Hamiltonian, between sets of qubits that aren't actually interacting. So that might be a bit of word salad, but hopefully some examples will help you get an idea of what I'm talking about. So the first um, perturbation gadget we're gonna talk about is the subdivision gadget. So what we've got here is this, this Hamiltonian here on the left. Um, it's just a simple Hamiltonian. It includes a term between A and B. And A and B here, they might be very distantly separated qubits. So this might be just a two local term, but a highly non-local, geometrically two local term. Or A and B here might be large sets of qubits. So what we've got here is a, is, you know, a K, -local, um, Hamilton, K local Hamiltonian term between two large sets of qubits. And the way we simplify that is um, just by introducing an ancillary qubit W, which we apply a very heavily weighted projector to, so that W is projected into a one-dimensional subspace. We then introduce interactions between A and W and B and W. And what you can show is that um, if you restrict to a low energy subspace, what you'll find is that in that subspace, this, this interaction graph here simulates this more complicated interaction graph on the left. So um, even though in the kind of the real system, A and B are no longer directly interacting, the qubit W mediates an interaction between these two non-interacting sets of qubits. Um, and this subdivision gadget can be used to a couple of things. So in the case that A and B are single qubits but distantly separated, you can use the subdivision gadget a number of times in order to break down a highly non-local interaction into a local one. Or in the case where A and B are large sets of qubits, you can use this interaction, this subdivision gadget again a number of times to break down a you know, K local interaction for K large into just a two local interaction. The, another uh, perturbation gadget we're gonna use is a crossing gadget. Um, so what we have here is this Hamiltonian here on the left um, includes a crossing. So it's not a kind of a 2D interaction graph, you'd need to uh, in, you know, include a crossing. So in order to break that down, we can again do something very similar. We introduce an ancillary qubit W, and again, we apply a very heavily weighted projector onto it. And then what you can show is that um, if, if you construct an interaction graph of this form here on the right and choose all the interactions appropriately, you can show that in the low energy subspace, this um, Hamiltonian simulates Hamiltonian here on the left. And finally, the fork gadget, again, it's a very similar idea, so I won't talk through it in detail. But what the fork gadget can be used to do is to um, reduce the degree of a, of, a, um, of a vertex in the interaction graph by replacing a, a vertex with two, uh, a ver uh, replacing an interaction where a qubit A interacts with two qubits with an interaction where it just interacts with one. Okay, so these, these perturbation gadgets, they allow you to take complex interaction graphs and simulate them with simpler ones. 
Um, and actually in, in their paper, what Toby, Ashley and Stephen do is they go further and they, they use some more complicated perturbation gadgets, which I'm, which I'm not going to attempt to explain in this seminar. Um, and they show that there is, by using these kind of perturbative simulations, there are families of Hamiltonians that are universal. When we say that a Hamiltonian is universal, if it can be used to simulate any other Hamiltonian. Um, and they do this by kind of steps of these perturbative, react, uh, perturbative simulations. And what's interesting is that they show these, these um, simple interactions, the Heisenberg interaction, the XY interaction, they remain universal, even if you restrict them to, to the interaction graphs. So, so this raises the question, can we, can we construct holographic quantum error correction codes with local boundary models by taking the happy code, using these perturbative simulations to simulate the non-local boundary Hamiltonian with a local one, and then get a, a more full toy model of ADS-CFT? Um, the first problem with doing this is that the happy code has a 1D boundary, and the techniques I've spoken to about only work in 2D or higher. So the first thing we need to do to do this is generalize the holographic quantum error correcting codes to higher dimensions. Um, so we're now going to talk through um, our toy model and how we, we use what I've spoken about so far to construct it. Um, so yeah, I'm going to start by talking about how we generalize these to higher dimensions. Um, and I'm then going to talk briefly about the actual construction and how the boundary Hamiltonian works before talking about how we, how we use this construction to get a mapping from the boundary to the bulk. So you might think generalizing the happy code to higher dimensions would be very simple. And um, to be honest, we did it at first as well. Um, but it turned out to be a little bit trickier than we expected. And the reason for that is that I said in the talk about the happy code, um, the authors of that paper, they used the properties of the perfect tensors along with the um, properties of the tessellation in order to derive properties of the, of the code. I mean, in two dimensions, you can do that quite nicely just by inspection. You know, you can get nice computer generated images of tessellations and and analyze them. When you try and do that in three dimensions, it gets a, gets a bit more complicated. So this is an image of the tessellation of hyperbolic three space by dodecahedrons. Um, and yeah, I, I can't get any useful information out of this. Um, so we needed another way to analyze properties of this tessellation. And the way we did that was using hyperbolic coxeter groups. Um, so a coxeter polytope is just a polytope living in either spherical Euclidean or hyperbolic space, which has all its dihedral angles, integers of multiples of pi. And what you can show is that if you have a coxeter polytope in some geometry X, then it will tessellate that geometry. And the reason this is nice is because you can also associate a geometric reflection group to this coxeter polytope, um, where the generators are reflections in the faces of your polytope. And then the relations between the generators are just determined by the angles between the faces. Um, and the reason this is nice is that all the properties of the tessellations can be inferred from the Coxeter group. So um, it just gives you a way to formalize analyzing these tessellations. And from this, we, we were able to get, um, we were able to derive conditions on the, the, con the conditions we need a tessellation to satisfy in order for it to be usable to, 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 um, to build a toy model of holographic duality using perfect tensors. So, so once we've got that step down, then the, then the steps to simplifying the, to, sorry, generalizing the happy code to higher dimensions was, was much more straightforward. So what we did is we built a holographic quantum error correcting code by placing a perfect stabilizer tensor in each polyhedral cell of a tessellation of hyperbolic uh, three space. Um, and using Coxeter theory, Coxeter group theory, we, we derived a condition on the Coxeter group for the tensor network to be an isometry from the bulk to the boundary. Um, and again, using the properties of the perfect tensors along with the properties of the Coxeter group, we could determine the properties of the boundary Hilbert space and the error correcting properties of the tensor network. Um, and in particular, we could calculate um, the weight of, for any given bulk operator, we could calculate the, the weight of the boundary operator, which is dual to that bulk operator. And it's just worth mentioning briefly that we, um, in order for our simulation techniques to work, we required that the perfect tensors will stabilize the perfect tensors. Um, and that's just because that ensures that the powerly rank of operators are preserved when they're pushed through the tensor network. Um, and that's important for us in order to be able to apply our simulation techniques. So this is this is kind of what our what our toy model, um, the actual tensor network of our toy model looks like. Um, now, what does the boundary Hamiltonian look like if, if we push it through this? So first off, we just take the the same boundary Hamiltonian that you get, um, the kind of highly non-local boundary Hamiltonian that you get 
just by pushing your bulk homoclonin through the tense network. And that just is in the happy, just as in the um, happy, happy uh, toy model case is going to be completely non-local. Um, and the way we do this is for each tensor in a tensor network, we construct this projector. Um, and this projector is just each tensor in the tensor network is individually a quantum error correcting code. And what these projectors are, they're just projectors onto the code space of that error correcting code if you view it as a code from the input indices to the output indices. Um, and then we then construct our non local boundary Hamiltonian in this way. So, what we have here, H bulk here is just a, um, you can just think about it as the logical operator acting on the boundary Hilbert space, which is dual to the, to the bulk Hamiltonian. Um, so, importantly, it's not equal to the bulk Hamiltonian um, multiplied by, this, by the isometry, encoding isometry of the tensor network. And the reason we can't use this, um, this sim perhaps simpler term is because this, wouldn't, this term wouldn't have the same Pauli rank as the, um, as the bulk operator. And it's important for our simulation technique that we preserve Pauli rank. And the way we use the, do that is by using this, um, this operator instead, which is, um, you know, it's because we're working with stabilized error correcting codes. Um, if we take this logical operator, then using kind of stabilized the group theory, we can construct an operator which which does preserve the Pauli rank of the of the um, bulk Hamiltonian. Um, but this bulk operator, it, it doesn't just act on the code space; it acts it acts um, it acts throughout the Hilbert space. So what we do is we use this um, term here to ensure that all states outside of the code space are very high energy, and this term is just a sum of all of the um, all of the the projectors onto the complement spaces of all of the individual error correcting codes. Um, and hopefully you can see this, this is just, um, this is an example of a perfect simulation. So what we have is that this non-local bound Hamiltonian action on the boundary is a perfect simulation of our bulk Hamiltonian. But just as with the happy code, it's completely non-local. Um, so what we do is we use perturbation gadgets to simulate each non-local by local boundary model. I'm not going to talk this through this in any detail, but essentially subdivision gadgets to take all the non-local interactions, break them down to two local, crossing interactions to get rid of any crossings we've introduced in the interaction graph, and then fork gadgets just to um, reduce, the reduce the degree of vertices in the interaction graph, so that we end up with something where, with, where each vertex is a constant degree independent of the size of the error correcting code. We then we use some of the more slightly more complicated universal quantum Hamiltonian techniques, which I haven't touched on here, um, and that allows us to simulate this um, this local hand boundary Hamiltonian by a boundary model which is acting on qubits with full SU two local symmetry. Um, now, throughout all these simulation steps, what I've done is I've introduced ancillary qubits, and you might be wondering, kind of, you know, how much bigger have we made the boundary? Um, and what we do in the paper is we keep track of all the extra qubits we introduce. And what we find is that if the initial boundary was on n qubits, qubits the final boundary is on n polylog n qubits. Um, and using the geometry of hyperbolic space, we can show that means that the new boundary is at a doubly logarithmic distance from the original boundary. So we have had to kind of increase the boundary Hilbert space a bit in order to, in order to get a local Hamiltonian, but it's not kind of it's still sort of a boundary geometrically. We haven't moved out to some, some huge um, distance in order to um, incorporate all these extra qubits. And the structural features of the ADS CFT, which are captured by the happy code, are still present. So we haven't kind of broke any of those features. Okay, so I'm now going to talk kind of quite briefly about the boundary to bulk mapping. Um, so the boundary Hamiltonian can be written in this form. So what we've got here is that H bulk is just the encoded version of the bulk operator. This term, second term here, these are the stabilizer terms. And as I said, we use this large parameter delta s to push those stabilizer terms up to high energy. And then the final, final term here, this term is the, all the, the, this captures all the perturbation gadget terms. Um, and again, we have another large parameter here, delta l, and delta l pushes all the kind of junk from the perturbative gadgets up to high energy. So delta L is always going to be bigger than delta S, and above delta L, the simulation just completely breaks down. So we're not interested in any energy scales above delta L. In order to figure out the mapping from the bulk to the boundary, 
what we do is we consider the boundary Hamiltonian, which is dual to the zero Hamiltonian in the bulk. So we just remove this H bulk term from our, um, from our boundary Hamiltonian. With this boundary Hamiltonian, um, we can decompose a boundary Hilbert space into subspaces. Um, and the, what these subspaces are is they're subspaces of energy delta S. Um, and because of the way this, this boundary Hamiltonian is composed, what we can show is that it's block diagonal with respect to this decomposition. Um, so it's probably easiest to show this with a picture. So what we find is that H generic um, below the energy cut of delta L is just this block diagonal um, matrix, where in each of these block diagonal blocks, um, what you've got is just a um, is just different stabilizer terms. So in, in this block of the matrix here, this is a code subspace. We're not violating any tensors, any stabilizer of the code. In this block here, we're violating one stabilizer of the code. And so here we're violating two stabilizers and so on. Now in the boundary, it's, it makes sense to talk about violating stabilizers of the error correcting code, that's well understood. But in the bulk, you can't violate a stabilizer because they're not acting in the same um, Hilbert space as the bulk. But the way we can think about it is think about um, what's actually happening in the bulk is if you're violating a stabilizer, what you've actually done is remove a tensor from the tensor network. Um, and obviously, obviously, um, if you're removing a tensor from the tensor network, there's more than one way you can do that. So actually, you can split this, this, um, you can split this decomposition further and not just have how many stabilizers have you removed from the tensor network, but what configuration are these, are these tensors in that you've removed. So what you end up with is a boundary Hilbert space, which is given by this direct sum um, expression. So what we have is these each Hilbert, each of these Hilbert spaces um, describes a tensor network with n holes, so n tensors removed in a particular configuration. Each of these tensor networks describes a different encoding isometry, um, and out of all these different encoding isometries, we can construct a unit tree. Um, which maps between the between the between the Hilbert spaces. So if we consider an arbitrary boundary state um, living in the boundary Hilbert space, we can map, you can use this unit tree to map that boundary Hilbert space, this boundary state, sorry, into a bulk state. And what we find is that this bulk state has a geometric interpretation. We can think of it as being a superposition over different bulk geometries. We can use a similar idea to, to map from boundary Hamiltonians to bulk Hamiltonians. So if we have a boundary Hamiltonian, which is just block diagonal with respect to this decomposition, the mapping back is very simple. Just for each of these, um, for each of these block diagonal terms, we can map them back to the bulk. And in doing so, we'll get a, a bulk Hamiltonian acting on a particular um, tensor network. So a particular tensor network with some um, tensors removed. The more interesting case is what happens when we take a bulk Hamiltonian, which, which isn't block diagonal. So this bulk Hamiltonian includes couplings between the different, um, the different configurations. And we can, for each, each kind of, um, you know, for each block diagonal term, we can work out what that looks like um, on the, in the configuration that it corresponds to um, by using the isometry um, corresponding to that particular tensor network. But, the non, but it's not an exact science anymore. So the non-diagonal terms in the boundary Hamiltonian, they correspond to couplings between the different bulk geometries. So what we find now is that the tensor network description is now only an approximation to the underlying bulk physics. Um, and we can no longer do this, do this process exactly. Can I, can I ask a question about this? Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, so, so you had these very specific, I mean, the sp specific basis of understood correctly where you start with a network, you remove uh, you know, remove tensors and then I guess you fix the, the dangling legs that into some states, I guess that's the configuration maybe that you mentioned, the C. Mm. Um, I guess, I mean, there are certain superpositions of such geometries, they do have a geometric meaning, right? Like if you wanted to entangle, for example, I mean, you, know, you remove some cells and now you want to add a connection. That I guess you could think of a superposition as two, two different, you know, copies of this disconnect of this, you know, uh, uh, geometry where the holes removed. So I guess in some, uh, and I was wondering, like, I guess you could that would, would that correspond to some interaction term like you just described in the previous slide? 
Um, yeah, that's really interesting. We hadn't actually thought. So when we talk about removing tents, we were then thinking about, you know, leaving those, leaving those like completely uncontracted so that you could buy you have complete freedom to violate those stabilizers. But yeah, I think if you yeah. then connected some of these dangling legs up again, what you'd be doing is um, you could think of this as a supposition of yeah, exactly yeah. Of, like supposition of choosing like you like you put in yeah zero zero or one one or something, right? And then it's yeah, as yeah. if you would have drawn a single tensor yeah, network, yeah. but then you yeah. Yeah, yeah, so we haven't actually about that, but yeah, that's a really, really interesting idea. And I think, yeah, that's the right way to think about it. Um, thank you. Um, are there any other questions about, about that? Um, cool. Um, so just to say very briefly, um, the perturbation gadget and Cox to group techniques, they straightforwardly generalize to higher dimensions. Um, the only thing you have to check is that whether a Cox to group of the properties you want exists in the dimension you're interested in. Um, the, the perturbation gadget techniques don't work for 2D to 1D, but in a recent paper, we did actually drive a new method of construction universal homotonies in 1D. Um, so the techniques are completely different, but the kind of take-home messages are very similar. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that in any detail. So I want to just, in the last kind of couple of minutes, talk very, very briefly about black hole formation. Um, so this is the place where the talk gets a little bit hand wavy. Um, it's not, you know, it's kind of a, a hopefully a nice idea that you can um, see how we can use this boundary to bulk mapping to get some intuition for what's going on, but um, you know, it's not completely rigorous, it is a little bit hand wavy. So um, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna choose a bulk Hamiltonian. And we're gonna say that this bulk Hamiltonian models semi-classical gravity. So we're gonna assume that we can construct a bulk Hamiltonian that has the qualitative features we'd like so that you know um, rings of um, excitations will collapse in with under this Hamiltonian. We're going to choose delta s. So if you remember, delta s is the um, energy penalty we, we give to states outside the code subspace. We're going to choose delta s so that it's bigger than um, one of these individual terms in the bulk Hamiltonian, but it's smaller than the total sum of the bulk Hamiltonian. So there do exist states within the code subspace that have energy greater than delta s. So in order to see this black hole formation, we're going to stay to start in the ground state of our, of our bulk Hamiltonian. What we then do is we apply some local bulk excitations on a ring of um, matter living right by living very close to the boundary. And if we kind of set up our the parameters in this Hamiltonian well, what we can ensure is that this bulk state is energy greater than delta s. But if we look at it on the boundary, what we're going to find is that we are still within the code subspace. And that's kind of obvious because we've applied a bulk operator. So that bulk operator on the boundary can't take us out of the code subspace. We're then going to let this bulk Hamiltonian, we're then going to let the system evolve under the bulk Hamiltonian. Um, and because we've said we've reconstructed a bulk Hamiltonian that models gravity, this shell of matter is going to fall inwards. Eventually, we'll end up in, the, in a situation where this, we've just got a single excitation acting right in the center of the bulk. Now, the evolution has been unitary, so we must still have energy greater than delta s, but we can't pick this up from order one bulk terms because of the way we've set up the parameters of the model. So what we find is that the, the way to conserve energy under unitary dynamics is to violate a stabilizer term. So on the boundary, we're violating a stabilizer term. That's kind of a fine, well understood um, boundary evolution. But on the bulk, what we have to have done is to, to remove a stabilizer from the tensor network. Um, and it's just, you know, this idea of removing stabilizers being, sorry, removing tensors being equivalent to black holes, that's not something we came up with. That's something that was suggested in the original happy code. Um, and they gave some kind of arguments of why this is a reasonable way of talking about, about, about black holes. What I think is nice about this kind of looking at it in the dynamics that we can come to the same conclusion um, from, from, a, from, you know, from a different perspective and from different arguments. Um, um, obviously this isn't gonna be possible if, if our boundary Hamiltonian is just um, block diagonal with respect to the decompositions I was talking about earlier. This is only gonna be possible if we have some, some couplings between the boundary between the different um, subspaces on the boundary. So thank you for your time. Um, just, to, just to wrap up, what we've done here is we've constructed a toy model of holographic duality with a bulk boundary mapping between local Hamiltonians. And this is many of the structural features of ADS-CFT um, that it kind of um, inherits from the happy code. It allows us to incorporate energy scales and dynamics into the toy models. Um, there are a number of open questions. So in particular, the kind of, I think the open question I'm most interested in, this obviously doesn't capture all of the, all of the aspects of ADS-CFT. There's a lot of, a lot of features still missing and Harriet's going to talk um, next about some a way we can add a few more features in but even the um, 
colour model that Harriet's going to talk about doesn't quite capture all of the features of ADS CFT. Um, so I think for me the interesting question is how far can we push these colour models before they don't work without gravity? So at the moment we don't have to put gravity in the bulk to get this duality to work, we could put any theory into the bulk. And that's implying that this duality has got nothing to do with gravity, but you know, the holographic principle is, principle is meant to be a statement about gravity. So I'm interested, you know, at what point do the toy models break down and do we have to start incorporating gravity? And you know, does that give us any insight into theories of quantum gravity? Um, so thank you very much for your time. I'm very happy to take any more questions.